where I really want to start is around the importance of transition finance. Um, and to, to kind of really dive right into this, um, what is really what is that role, do you think, for, for corporates in, in achieving a net zero future? Um, where do you think, especially there are challenges, and where do you think more needs to be done? Cool, thank you Over so to much. You. And great to see you, great, great to be here, and I hope you, you enjoy some good food. Um, so let me maybe first acknowledge one thing, because when we talk about transition finance and, and net zero and, and so on, we always relate to climate. Um, I just want to say one thing first is we actually have quite a few sustainability challenges that we're facing. There is nature and loss of biodiversity. There's a whole raft of, of social issues. Think about social equity. Uh, and we also still need economic growth to empower all of this. Um, there are 17 UN SDGs for a reason, which are all, all encompassing. But if we then zoom into climate, and actually there were three questions in one, I think, so let me dissect this a little bit. How important is transition finance? Um, well, it's simply mission critical. So if we think about the sustainability challenges we face, they're quite daunting. We need to effectively completely rewire our economy. So think about the big themes. We need to green our energy supply. We will electrify many things in our economies. Think mobility. We have to invest a lot in efficiency, among others, energy efficiency. And we need to rethink not only the processes, but also the materials we use when we produce actually products, so circular economy concepts and so on and so forth. And the financing needs are quite staggering, right? So depending on how you slice and dice the data, we're probably going to need close to 4.5 trillion USD a year to make this all happen. And if you think about the big themes I just mentioned, if you only focus on green, for example, renewals, we ain't going to get there. Yeah, we need to empower aviation and shipping companies to decarbonize. We have to help cement and steel producers to uh, become less carbon intense. So there's a lot of brown activities that we need to make green. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Uh, challenges. Well, we, we committed to being net zero in our finance submissions by 2050 last year. And in about a few weeks' time, we're going to publish something really exciting, we think. Um, a very detailed paper around our approach, how to be select science-based pathways, how did we select science-based interim targets for 2030 and such. And that forced us to really accelerate our homework on data, on modeling, the really hard discussions. And naturally, if you go through that process, uh, you're going to face a lot of challenges. One is indeed data. Data is OK, but it's far from perfect. And we need to massively improve it, which hopefully is going to happen. Then you need kind of a consensus around what is an acceptable transition. So we took on board science-based pathways from highly reputable uh, um, organizations like the IEA and so on and so forth, but we also needed to discuss internally what is actually possible. So having a consensus around that is, is really important. And then we need to acknowledge that in certain sectors, we're not yet there. We don't have commercially viable technology. So quite a few uh, challenges ahead. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to tackle all of that uh, and we need to be mindful that we need an ecosystem change. We are a bank. We have a role to play in a bigger ecosystem change. We need governments, regulators, we need the private sector, we need the finance sector, all of us embedded in the community at large to come together. Um, and I think one thing that's really quite critical in this ecosystem change is something very simple, reduce policy uncertainty. So if we, if we want to unlock CapEx, from the private sector, they need to believe in the direction of travel. And here, for example, um, uh, governments can help. And as you're, as you're thinking about this transition piece, and as you said, you're a year into this, I want to ask you in, in, a, in a little bit to think about maybe if you can give us some, some previews about what might be coming in that report. Um, I'm sure there's a lot that you guys have been, been thinking about. Um, but I want to hear, what are you thinking about the role of carbon credits as you're thinking about what that, that transition looks like? Is this something where it's you know, some people will say it's a cop-out. It's not something you should be going for. Some people will say it's a necessary piece for, for hard to abate. You know, where, where are you guys falling down in that piece? How are you tackling what you can tackle now versus what, what you might look to carbon credits for? Yeah, so carbon credits, we acknowledge it's a contentious topic, right? And, and many people criticize it for different, different parts of reasons. We believe, if done well, they're actually a very important tool to unlock capital. So then the question is, how does well look like? So when we interact with clients, it all starts with strategy. So you need to discuss with clients science-based, credible decarbonization strategies. 
And as part of that strategy, then you typically have a hierarchy of actions. You want to prevent emissions, you want to avoid and reduce emissions, and ultimately offset the hard to abate or unavoidable. Um, on top of that, there's also the what we call the high ambition path. So on your journey to becoming net zero, you may also want to buy carbon credits. But two things are critical. One is the quality of the credit. So you need to make sure that what you buy really adds value. And there are lots of acronyms these days, but the ICVCM, so the Integrity Council for Voluntary Carbon Markets, they will soon publish the core carbon principles and they will define what good look like, what's permanent, additional, and so on and so forth. That's quality. The other one is, what do you do, how do you use the credits? And, and what claims can you make? And another beautiful acronym, the VCMI, Voluntary Carbon Market Integrity Initiative, they recently came up with um, a template effectively, a code of conduct almost, what claims can you do? But in layman's terms, be humble and transparent and tell people how you use them. So if there's good quality and you are transparent around how you use them as part of a strategy, then I think it's a powerful tool. And then I want to come back to this piece about what you all are tangibly doing. Um, I kind of want to tie it to the, the topic of our conversation, which is purpose-driven business. And so with your, with your DBS uh, bank hat on and with your personal hat on, what do you think it means to be a purpose-driven business? Yeah. So for us, purpose is everything. So some people think it's fluff. We think it's the essence. And if you think about the origins of DBS as the development bank of Singapore, the original is very much about supporting the industrial development in Singapore. So purpose is very much ingrained. I joined DBS a little while ago, and it's literally palpable. When you go down the, the hallways, you can really see a strong sense of purpose. And we have this beautiful vision, which is to be the best bank for a better world. And the, and the latter part encapsulates the, the approach we have to sustainability. And I have the privilege to be the CSO in an organization where senior management is fully supportive and instills purpose and culture in the organization, that's, that's quite, quite amazing. And what we're now going to have to do effectively is we're going to publish this paper. It's a beautiful 60 page or so, but what then, right? Then we need to get it out of the boardroom, down into the trenches. And there are lots of homework that we also need to do. One is capacity building, right? We, we, want, we are a bank, so we are enabling stuff by providing lending and financing. We're not producing t-shirts, iPads, or cars. So we need our relationship managers, for example, to be able to talk to clients and ideate together with them to empower them to decarbonize. So capacity building is big. We need to have a robust governance structure and KPIs uh, to make sure we're running into the right direction. Uh, and one big thing, Bloomberg being a data company, is also on data. So we are currently rethinking how we're going to redesign parts of our IT architecture, which at DBS is really quite amazing, 28% of our workforce, 28% are either data scientists or software engineers. So we have a very strong focus on tech. We have a very strong focus on creating efficient data architectures. And we're thinking this through. How can we automate the sucking in of data, processing it, and empowering the, the various different parts in the bank to go to clients and come up with, with solutions? And how are you using that workforce to really help you? All the people who are, who are part of the DBS Bank family, how do you put them to work to help you with the transition? The DBS employees. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So we had a we had a, a very nice session this morning. It's called Future Forward. It's, it's a big uh, three-day HR event. And I effectively just said, I have this one dream. We are 33,000 people at DBS. And I want everybody to understand the why and be empowered and motivated to, to really help. And then it comes back to the levers I mentioned, right? You need to do a bit of capacity building. You need to capture the hearts. You need to instill purpose and culture. It's very, very important. If you don't have pur purpose as an organization, I think you're not going to make it. So there are loads of levers we have to do. And then irrespective of what your position in the bank is, we hope that you're going to be part of the, of the movement. We have one minute left together. So in your role as a chief sustainability officer, what is the one biggest thing that you need? I think what I need, I actually got, which is a purpose-driven organization where senior management really supports the agenda. If you have that in place, the rest is all technical challenges, right? We need to get data right, and we need to do capacity building, and so on. But if you have the purpose, and if you have senior management that really wants to push the agenda, I think then you're in a good spot, and that's the case for us.